Okay, I'm going to switch to English because I want to keep uh, up with the image <laughs> that, I, that I have. Because <laughs> if I started speaking Turkish, it would go down the drain. <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to thank also the Metal Language Studies Society for giving me the opportunity to be the first speaker in their first activity that they organized. I think it's a very special, it's a very a special thing, it's a very great honor for me, uh, and I thank you for that. I would also like to thank all of you for coming in this cold weather to, when you don't have your own classes, to come and listen to this talk. Um, and let me tell you from the start, normally my talks are when I give a talk, and those of you who have taken my classes, you know that I am a very technical kind of person. Uh, but this talk is not like that. This talk is, I actually really want to thank for this opportunity because it gave me a chance to create a thought where I can easily say I think and I believe this and I don't have any evidence for this, but it seems like that to me. So um, I'm going to, I, I gave the talk a title which says, um, if I turn on off the light, that bother you? Maybe like that or like that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I gave the talk the name um, New Speak and Unmentful Speak. Unmentful obviously is not a word of English, it's a word of New Speak. So um, what I meant to say with this is, is New Speak a non-human language? Is it a language that's not meant for humans? What is it meant for? Because, as you will see, and those of you who have read the book 1984, um, you know that Newspeak is really um, a product of a society that we would not call entirely human-friendly. So I wanted to explore in this talk how unmentful Newspeak really is. And before we start, talking about Newspeak, I want to talk about 1984 a little bit. 1984 was a cool year. It was a great year to be alive. Those of you who weren't alive in 1984, <laughs> you have stuff to regret because there were so many cool releases in 1984. Some in movies, like Nightmare on Elm Street came out in that year. Gremlins came out in that year. Ghostbusters came out in that year. Karate Kid came out in that year. I was so in love with this guy. It was the time when there was no internet. I went, I, I, I smuggled a camera into the movie theater to be able to take pictures of the screen and look at them later on. Footloose came out in 1984. Paris, Texas, an extremely cool movie, also came out in 1984. Amadeus. I saw Amadeus four times in the first week that it opened in the theaters. Not only movies, but songs. Alphaville came up with Big in Japan and Forever Young. Tina Turner released What's Love Got to Do With It. George Michael, Careless Whisper. When? Wake me up before you go, go. Purple Rain, Prince, like the Virgin Madonna, and Born in the USA. All of this came out in 1984. I was actually, when I was compiling this list, I myself was amazed at how great this year was. <laughs> Books, that was not that cool, but still we have several titles that I'd like to put forth. The Hunt for Red October later on turned into a very successful movie. The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera also turned into a movie, but no, maybe that. Maybe it's <laughs> still more known as a book than as a movie. John Updike's The Witches of Eastwick. And then there were a few other things that happened in 1984 that made it a really cool year. Tetris was released. <laughs> And Band-Aid happened in 1984. Have you ever heard of this? This was a huge movement in the rock and pop community of America and England, initially, to help the populations of Africa, feed, yeah, feed Africa. And they had a huge <coughs> concert that happened the same day 
in England and in the States. I don't in England it was in London, but I don't remember where in um, but it was extremely cool because uh, Bob Geldof, uh, sorry, not Bob Geldof, but Phil Collins. Phil Collins actually participated in both by jumping on a concert and flying to America after giving the um, giving the concert in England. And last but not least, Steve Jobs released his Macintosh in 1984. But for our purposes today, at least, and most, maybe even uh, in general, 1984 is perhaps most famous for the rendition uh, that it was given in the 1949 book by George Orwell. Now, for those of you who haven't read the book, if there are some like that, I'm not going to go into the details of the plot. I'm not going to give away what happens and uh, what doesn't, because maybe there is a chance that those of you who still haven't read it, if you haven't read it, go and read it with a fresh eye. But it does, I'm going to give a summary, a little bit of what the situation is in the country of Oceania that is uh, described in 1984. It is a gloomy society, it's a gray society, it is a very scary society where there is this figure of Big Brother, so Big Brother is not only the show, it is originally the figure that um, keeps um, an eye on everything that happens in Oceania, everything that the citizens do, everything that they think, and at all times. So you're always watched by the eye of the Big Brother. Now, um, Big Brother, of course, is just a prompt for a bunch of people who form the inner party. The party is the ruling party in the, in the country, and the inner circles are the elitist circles of the, of the government who actually dictate everything in Oceania, control people's future, but not only their future, perhaps more scarily, they also control their past. And we will see in a little bit how that is possible. The ideology of the party is the so-called INGSOC, or that's the short for English Socialism, um, denies an individual any power or any privacy. So you don't matter at all. The protagonist of the, mo of the book, Winston Smith, is a member of the outer party. So he is a member of the party. Everybody who wants to survive in a relatively decent way in this country has to be a member of the party. But he is a member of the outer party, so he is a less important member of this organization. He works for the Ministry of Truth. The Ministry of Truth, yes. The Ministries of Truth as you will see, or as you know if you have read the book, is actually the Ministry of Lies. What they do is they, they present fiction as fact, they invent um, things that never happened, they uh, claim that things that happened never happened, and so on and so forth. And he has a really interesting job. His job, Winston's job, is to rewrite articles that were published at some previous date in the Times, and his job is to take a look at the articles and compare the content of the article to the present moment. And if the content of the article is in any way in contradiction with the present, if in any way it presents the party in a bad light, then his job is to rewrite the article in such a way that it is closer to the present, so that it agrees with the present. This is how the party <coughs> controls the past. Because after a while, nobody really remembers what the truth is. Um, so here is an example, an excerpt from the book itself, where Winston talks about his own, or thinks about his own um, job. And he says, the Times of the 19th of December had published the official forecasts of the output of various classes of consumption goods in the fourth quarter of 1983 
which was also the sixth quarter of the ninth three-year plan. Today's issue contained a statement of the actual output, from which it appeared that the forecasts were in every instance grossly wrong. Winston's job was to rectify the original figures by making them agree with the later ones. Um, now, Winston's job is, of course, to alter the facts that were published previously, but he also rewrites um, history. So he writes history, he rewrites history of conflicts that Oce Oceania was involved in. So he says, at, very, um, at some point in the book, page 43, at this moment, for example, in 1984, if it was 1984, because he doesn't even know what year it is. He doesn't know whether he can believe his, whether he can trust his belief that it is 1984. So at this moment, for example, Oceania was at war with Eurasia and in alliance with East Asia. In no public or private utterance was it ever admitted that the three powers had at any time been grouped along different lines. Actually, as Winston well knew, it was only four years since Oceania had been at war with East Asia and in alliance with Eurasia. But that was merely a piece of furtive knowledge, which he happened to possess because his memory was not satisfactorily under control. Officially, the change of partners had never happened. Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania, Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. So it is, um, it is a scary kind of place, Oceania. Another aspect of Winston's job, which I think is, which, which is perhaps the most important for this talk, is that when he rewrites history, when Winston rewrites past articles, he also is instructed to rewrite them in this new language that the party surely, but slow, slowly but surely, imposes on the citizens of Oceania. Newspeak is not, um, there is no law that says you need to speak Newspeak. But Newspeak is so much everywhere around you in this country that it is making its way into uh, the speech of the people. So, of course, the, the members of the party who work at the Ministry of Truth are instructed specifically to use Newspeak because they are one of those factors that make sure that Newspeak is everywhere. Um, so, what is Newspeak? Newspeak is a variety of English, which is referred to as Old Speak. And it is imposed from above, it is imposed from the party. It is edited and constrained in such a way as to make impossible for people to have any kind of unorthodox, original, or rebellious thought. Through the imposition of this language, what the party aims to do is limit the cognitive capacity of the minds of its own citizens. Now, how is that possible? Well, this idea that the imposition of a, a language, the imposition of newspeak um, on people will serve the purpose of limiting their cognitive capabilities um, is linked to the principle of linguistic relativity, which was flourishing in the 30s and 40s of the last century, and it is known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. The hypothesis that says that, and actually today when we talk about the list of the principle of, when we talk about um, Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, we referred to the strong version of that hypothesis and the weak version of that hypothesis. This difference actually is a later development. Neither Sapir or Worf really believe that there are any uh, differences in the strength of the hypothesis. Uh, according to the strong version of the hypothesis, the structure of the language that one speaks determines the way that person perceives the world around them. 
according to the weaker hypothesis, the structure of the language that one speaks influences the way one perceives the, life, the world around him or her. Um, so the idea is the idea that new speak will limit the cognitive uh, capabilities of the human mind is obviously re related to this idea, the principle of better linguistic relativity, which says, you know, if you want to determine how people think, make sure they speak a certain kind of language. And new speak was supposed to be the kind of language that, instead of enriching the person's um, perception of the world, was meant to impoverish it. Um, so this, this, the linguistic relativity principle, um, for example, predicts that people whose languages have um, separate names for various colors will perceive a rainbow differently than people whose languages do not have a word for each and every color of the rainbow. So if your language, for example, has a single term for blue and green, or if it has a single term for red and pink, then the way you see the rainbow is going to be different uh, than from, from the person whose language contains all of the names. Um, so what the creators of Newspeak wanted to achieve is they wanted to exclude from the language all the, um, all the words that have unorthodox or original ring to them. So they, if, if, for example, they remove the word freedom from the language, the reasoning went, then people will not be able to conceive of freedom anymore. Or independence, or honor, or justice. Okay. Um, the party, in order to achieve this um, impoverishment, the party employs people who, whose job is to edit the vocabulary of new speak. So the aim being that all heretical thought, heretical meaning everything that's not along the lines of the party's politics, impossible. Um, Winston, in, in chapter four, I think, Winston talks to his acquaintance, Stein, and Stein works on the, 11, which he proudly proclaims to be the final uh, edition of the Dictionary of Newspeak. So they're creating a dictionary, the 11th edition. The fact that it is the 11th edition tells you that Newspeak has been around for a while, right? Because it takes some time for a dictionary to be compiled, uh, and I'm going to take that information quite seriously a bit later on. And here's what Sign tells Winston. He says, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word with its meaning rigidly defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Every year, fewer and fewer words and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. And then he goes on and he says, you think, I dare say, that our chief job is inventing new words. But not a bit of it. We just encountered one of them. Thought crime. That's a new, that's a new word. Um, you think, I dare say, that our chief job is inventing new words, but not a bit of it. We're destroying words. Scores of them, hundreds of them, every day. We're cutting the language down to the bone. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Of course, the great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives, but there are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. It isn't only the synonyms, there are also the antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word which is simply the opposite of some other word? A word contains its opposite in itself, like good, for example. If you have a word like good, what name is there for a word like bad? Ungood will do just as well, better because it's an exact opposite, which the other is not. So, what people working on the 11th edition of Newspeak do <coughs> is 
um, they apply the following processings to old speak or English. One of these processes is adding new words to the language. And these things are mostly compounds. So crime think. To crime think replaces all the words which are grouped about the concepts of liberty and equality. So everything that you think that has to do with liberty or equality is called crime think. Good think, on the other hand, is to think in an orthodox manner, the, the manner that the party wants you to think in. Duck speak. Duck speak literally means to quack like a duck. And this word is actually quite ambiguous because it depends on what you're saying. If you're saying something that goes against Big Brother, against the party, then it is a very derogative word. It really means quack like a duck. But if you're saying things that praise Big Brother and the party, then duck speak is a compliment. It means you do really well at doing what you're doing. Um, so those, that's, that's one of the processes that we observe. We also observe a different process that I just referred to, expelling of words from new speak. So we have <coughs> honor, justice, morality, democracy, science, all of these words that might make people question are expelled from uh, the language with the ultimate aim of expelling, them, uh, expelling those concepts from the mind. The third process is that the language is regularized so that almost all idiosyncrasies of lexical items are abandoned. So what you used to call good, better, best becomes good, good, or goodest. Or good versus well becomes good versus good wise. So adverbs are formed by adding a wise to the adjective. Um, man, human. So the adjective of, that relates to man is replaced by the adding of full to the uh, noun itself, so it becomes manful. All right, so add, addition of words, ex, uh, expulsion of words, and the regularization of words. We also have two ways in which the language is impoverished. One is that the nuances of meaning that you, today, can express or that you could express in old speak like splendid, wonderful, or excellent are all words that have <coughs> good as the as the as the you know the meaning of good is, is contained in the meaning of all of them, uh, but they refer to different degrees. They are all abandoned and they are replaced by one single word plus good. If you want to go either further, so fantastic, amazing, or thrilling, those words are expelled too, and they are replaced by double plus good. Okay, so this is really, really good. <laughs> um, another way in which the language is impoverished is that the synonyms and antonyms are uh, expelled. So what used to be good is good and bad, becomes good and ungood. Dark and light no longer exist as opposition, rather dark or undark, or light or unlight. Either way would work for this speaker. Okay. okay. So the object of this whole thing is that new speak is really, really scary. Enter a linguist. So we're now going to tear new speak apart a little bit from the ling linguistic perspective. Okay. Now, I do agree that the aim of Newspeak is scary. The idea that the range of consciousness of the human mind can be, or should be, limited uh, is scary. And reducing human beings to unthinking bodies and their expression to that <coughs> speak is also scary. But how scary is the language itself? How unmanful? is it when we look at it from the perspective of the linguistic aspect of human mind. So I'm going to uh, divide the major interventions to old speak into two different groups. 
One is word loss, addition of new words, and elimination of oddness in word formation. And so we eliminate everything that's odd and we try to fit everything into regularized um, molds. That is new. But then, at the same time, the composition in word formation survives. Actually, it is encouraged <coughs> because you no longer want to say well, you want to say woodful, right? So you, the language encourages you to compose. The rules of syntax, mostly untouched in new speak, not even addressed. The structure of the language is preserved. And the language itself seems to be learnable by children. This is where the 11th edition is important because I believe that in the course of 11th editions of Newspeak, some children were born and they acquire this language, right? Because the language is everywhere. Um, and that's old. That has not changed. Newspeak is not that new in all its respects. All right, so let's first talk about the old in Newspeak. Um, the composition of words and sentences, the computation of their meaning. Notice that the more composition requires more computation, right? Because in order to interpret good full, you have to interpret good and interpret full, and then combine the two. Um, and the learnability of the system. Those are the three things that I think are old in Newspeak. And let us remember that it is often said that what makes us human is precisely this ability to use language. The ability to manipulate meaningful pieces of language and create new things by doing that. On the other hand, if a language can be acquired by a child, then it must be that its grammar <coughs> is compatible with the principles of universal grammar, if you believe in universal grammar, which I happen to <coughs> So if really there is a certain way that human language has to look, and that way is determined by the way our mind is structured at birth, then Newspeak cannot be further from that, right? It cannot be outside of the realm of universal grammar. So the fact that it is learnable, the fact that it allows for combination and therefore for creation in the expression, I think makes this language no less manful than any other natural language. It does, I, when you first think about Newspeak, it really is something nobody would want to speak. But it's really not all that bad. Because it does allow you to do what you always do in language. Yes. What Saim says, remember, he says we are cutting the language down to the bone. Well, what I think there is no down to the bone with language. Because language is like phoenix, it always rises up. Because human mind cannot not do language. So, if you start with good, and you do plus good, that's allowed, right? And then you do double plus good. Well, who is to say you won't do triple plus good? That's already creative. That's already outside of what the party wants you to do. Triple plus gooder? Why not? Start with good. Go with plus good. Double plus good. Double minus good? Double minus ungood? Why not? That's not 
what they wanted you to do. But that's what you can do. Right? Big brother, and big brother, and big brother full, and big brother full wise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> now, language, any language, even new speak, is created <coughs> by the mere fact that it's a language and that it is the property of the mind. So that's why I say you cannot get to the bone of the language. There is no such thing. Language is recreated with every generation of infants that acquire it as its native tongue. And there has been no language so far that has been invented, imposed, uh, created, reduced, edited by the powers from above that the human mind has not been able to reclaim as its own. Now, humans not only develop and change languages that they speak and that they hear around them, but they also invent new language if they're given an opportunity. And if I have time, should I do it? I'd like to share with you a story of a creation of a language, which is a little bit outside of 1984 and Newspeak, but it's, um, it's an interesting and very hope-giving story for the citizens of Oceania, for example. So we're t uh, some of you who took Linguistics One from you may have seen this movie, but I want to show it. It's a clip of like six minutes that I'd like to uh, play to you. We're talking about the country of Nicaragua, where in the 70s and 80s of the last century, uh, deaf people who had no way of communicating with each other or with anyone else because <coughs> their impairment was not recognized, was not given importance. Um, so in the 70s and 80s, um, there was a major movement in Nicaragua to invent or to give deaf people an opportunity to participate in linguistic behavior. And what they did is they, well, let me give you, let me show you the movie. It's a short movie and it's on YouTube. So. Places of the world, there are those who hardly have any language at all. Maria Nonale, Mary No Name. Deaf since birth, she has been isolated all her life, both from the people who could help her and from others with her disability. Her friend, linguist Judy Kegel, understands the depth of her isolation. The two can communicate just a little using simple and primitive gestures. The first time I met her, she was missing the ability to tell me who she was. She was missing the ability to tell me how old she was. She doesn't know her name. In order to tell me who she was, she had to take me home and show me the papers and pictures of her family. Um, we had to share context. She can tell me things. I can show you a bit. She can tell me what happened to her father. <coughs> I asked her about her father dying, and she said three, okay? What three meant was she was shot three times. I know this from working with the other deaf signer, that she said he was shot in three places, and that's how her father died, right? Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, but, but three is just not enough to give me access to the information that I would have needed had I not had prior knowledge about that. <laughs> okay, what she's saying is, I have a daughter that went away and got married and that was it, she never came back. I had a son that went away. 
and I never heard from him again. You know, that's it, I'm alone. That's my life. She was language ready. Um, the problem was she didn't get access to language within that critical period, and that critical window for learning language in the way that we learned it is closed. This window for language remains open until we reach age seven. Then it slowly closes as we advance towards puberty. Before the 1980s, many deaf Nicaraguans were like Mary No Name. They never encountered the window for language because they never encountered others with their disability. But in 1980, after the Nicaraguan revolution, the new government tried to enhance deaf people's lives. They brought deaf village children into Managua to end their isolation. Here, educators tried to teach them an existing sign language. The effort failed. The children showed little interest in learning a language forced upon them. Instead, they began communicating with each other in their own way. Judy Kegel was summoned from the United States to sort out the problem. I came down thinking wherever there were deaf people, there was a sign language, and that obviously there would be a, a full-blown sign language in full swing here in Nicaragua. And they, I said, well, you know, I, I can learn a bit of their sign language if that's what you want, and then work with you on learning it. They said, no, they don't have sign language. They have, they have mimicas. They have mind gestures. And they pointed to a group of kids and said, we want to know what they're talking about. It turned out they were talking about a lot more than anyone dreamed possible. Kegel had arrived in Nicaragua shortly after the birth of a new language. Okay. So, I'm going to stop it here because you know, the rest of it is not that important. So, the reason why I wanted to show you this is to reinforce upon you the idea that Language is human, it has to be human. Human mind needs language. It's ready for <coughs> language. And it does language. It does language better, maybe, than it does anything else. Um, so I think it is impossible to kill the linguistic in the mind of a human being. You can, you can edit your vocabulary all you want, but the linguistic mind of a human will never stop being linguistic, will never stop being combinatorial, will never stop being creative. Newspeak fares no better. Newspeak, I think, attempts to curb the human thought, but the attempt does not even begin to curb the creative language usage. The ability to manipulate meaningful bits of language, and that is at the heart of our humanness. Now, so far I've looked at things that are old in Newspeak and the reasons why I think Newspeak is in fact old speak with some new words. But let's take a look at the new in Newspeak. So remember I had that slide that where I had three processes that made Newspeak new. The processes that we had on that slide, and I will have them here again, are actually none else than the processes which occur naturally in the process of language change and language development. <coughs> so word loss, remember they are killing words, they are destroying words, there is, uh, it's a beautiful thing to destroy words, says sign, but we experience word loss across time in language anyway. So at some time previously, English had the word anon, which meant at once. And if you ever had read original Shakespeare, it's full of this. This word is everywhere, but not anymore. Uh, though, used to mean you, is also everywhere in Elizabethan time, nowhere to be found right now. Except when you were getting married, maybe. I don't know if they still ask you. The though probably not even there. Another one is the addition of new words, right? That's what, what, that's what the research department, the so-called <coughs> research department of the party does. Well, we do that too, right? Google, as a verb, 
is a very commonplace thing right now. But when I was growing up in beautiful 1984, I had no clue what to Google might mean. Right? YouTuber. I spoke about YouTubers yesterday to my uh, linguistic class. I had no clue what a YouTuber is until like a couple of months ago my son taught me. He's 10. I'm like, what is YouTuber? He's like, mom, how can you not know what a YouTuber is? I'm too old to know what a YouTuber is, I guess. Right? Elimination of oddness in word formation. So instead of saying well, we say goodful. Well, this is a process that occurs naturally in language development as well, with the caveat that it usually occurs in inflectional morphology rather than in derivational morphology. So Old English had more than 300 irregular words. Irregular verbs, sorry. And so at some point, the verb climb was past, its past tense was clone. And laugh had a past tense low. But nowadays, you wouldn't even understand if somebody told you, you know, I clone a mountain yesterday. Right? It was regularized. It was it was turned into a, a verb that goes through ed affixation, um, just like we have in newspeak, right? So what I want to say is that the problem with newspeak is not so much the processes that are applied to it, because part of it, part of the part of the language is untouched. And that's the part which I think allows for creativity and, and humanness in you speak. Part of it is new, but the part that is new is really not the problem, is not that these processes happen. The problem is that the choice of which words go and which words say and which words are regularized and which words are not are, are made from above. So that's what makes new speak. That's the only thing that makes new speak scary. Everything else is just language. So, as a final thought, I'd like to, um, well, it's one of the final thoughts that I'll have. I'd like to say that um, even, even stripping a language of, you know, all the terms that relates to freedom and science and knowledge and justice will probably not result in a total disappearance of what we do, which is questioning the reality around us. That, that's what we do. And we do that <coughs> regardless of whether we do or don't have the names for the things that we ponder. And I found an example online that says, you don't say, I'm going to invent electricity, now I just have to figure out what it is, right? So before electricity was invented, or discovered, or I don't know how to say that, people thought about, Tesla probably had the thought about the thing that he wanted to do before there was a name for it, right? So I think that Newspeak is doomed. It is doomed to end up just like any other run-of-the-mill human language, with all intricacies, all the expressive power that languages have, and this is because it's part of our mind, and that is creative by definition. So I think that Newspeak is doomed, because in the end I don't think it is as unmentful as the party might believe it to be. I guess questions, if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to discuss them. Uh, but as you could probably uh, notice, I'm not an expert on 1984 or literature or, or Orwell or Newspeak. <laughs> um, but if you do have things that were unclear in the presentation, I'd be
be happy to clarify. It was a great talk. It's very inspiring. Thank you. I meant it to be inspiring. I think we all need to be inspired these days. Super double. Yeah, super double. Is it? Super double. Good. That whole class good. That whole class good. But I'll say I'll take triple. <laughs> to any linguistic expression managed to keep generations without voice. So I agree with you. Not everything is pink, but there is a dot of pink in that blank. <laughs> we're shopping that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, when you were presenting, I remember a student paragraph. Uh, I learned the vocabulary item when I was reading and marking the paragraph for, uh, for the proficiency exam. It was staycation. Staycation is spending your vacation at home doing nothing. Ah, there you go. <laughs> and I learned that vocabulary item from a student, and I said that that student is not a linguist. The new speak for me is some kind of a language planning from uh, top down. It is. Uh, but staycation is another way of reacting to language, but this is bottom up. Exactly. And I started using that staycation in many instances since I and I checked the dictionary and the online re and I realized that it is a common word now. In the eleventh edition, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Please. Well, you know, <clears throat> I wonder why regulars? Why didn't you make use of irregular processes as well? Why compounding and regulars? I mean, today we know why, because of the comparative productivity of the processes. But back in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, how did you figure out that regulars and compounds are much more productive? Plus, you can see this in Turkish, right? Because Turkish underwent the language revolution. And you have a lot of compounds and a lot of regularity, and we've lost almost all the regularity in the language. So Thank God for <laughs> that. <laughs> Right? So, so, apparently, in the, early 19th, in the early 20th century, people were already aware of what Pinker later on like, packaged and presented to us, right? Exactly, yes. So, um, to reduce the cognitive cost of them. Well, yes, but... They all really think for you. I don't think they were not... No, I, I don't think that the idea was the productivity. I think the idea was, you know, in order to create a compound, you need to compose the two things that are relatively simple. So if you have simple mindset, you will still do compounding rather than irregularity. That's what I think was the... Yes, but with, with compounding, you give ordinary people a way to undo things. If, exactly. it's ir if it was irregular, you would write, you, 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 you could block them. To a certain extent. If it worked. Yes, if it worked. If it worked. I agree. So, yeah. Maybe, maybe Orwell himself wanted it to fail. Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe the idea was to present a language that does fail. And maybe he was aware that if you did it with irregulars, it wouldn't. But or it might not. Let's not tell anyone about this. <laughs> Sometimes some of the authors, they create a language, they create new vocabulary items, for instance, 
and they use it so well that after you read the uh, chapter or you read the book, you want to use that vocabulary mm -hmm. item. Uh, and that's the role of a person who, who makes literature. But I agree with you. I don't think Orwell wants it to work. I want. I think he wants it to fail. fail. Mm -hmm. yes. I believe that. And if he had to, sorry, no, no, please go. I ahead. just wanted to thank you. I mean, this was such a thought-provoking and awareness-raising. I mean, presentation. I'm sure that from now on, we'll all um, consider the new words that we use. Mm -hmm. I remember that last <laughs> semester. In one of the classes, one, uh, I also learned a word from my daughter. She once said, Anne, niye atarlanıyorsun? Then I came to class, atarlanıyorsun, she said. Atar yapma, she said. And then I came to the class and I shared this with the younger generation. I asked what she actually means. I mean, is this a bad word or is this just, yeah, ne niye sinirlen, sinirleniyorsun ki? Something like that. And there I realized that it's really bad, actually. And then we started thinking about this. So because there is no consistency. Some people say atarlanmak, some people say atar yapmak. And then I said that actually we're experiencing such a critical moment now. And in 10 years time, you will remember this day. Because now we're trying to decide whether atarlanmak will be used as a word or together with atar yapmak, it will stay as a noun. So thank you very much. I mean, this um, presentation will always be remembered, I'm sure, about this. And we'll think about the new words. Um, I mean, we'll think about this um, new speak when we um, come across new words. Oh, and I included, by the way, in the presentation, I don't know if I will be able to share this with you. There is a, there is a, a, a place on the internet where you can find the PDF of the book. Mm -hmm. And there is also a link to the movie. But if you haven't read the book, I would recommend reading the book before you see the book. <laughs> That's all my thought. Well, I'm glad you liked the presentation. Any other comments or questions? Ah, yes, um, yes. So, if we link the linguistic part with the educational part, and if we kind of imagine a different dimension, like um, they try to delete some words so that we can't imagine a better world. So, if, as, if, as the educators, if we teach those vocabulary to new generations, do you believe as a linguist and as an educator we could create a better world or we could empower new generations? <laughs> <laughs> well, my bet is on the newer of the younger generation, no matter what we do. <laughs> I, mean, I, I kind of hope that the new generation, independently of us, will always strive for the better. Um, and as to whether, I'm not a big believer in um, this linguistic relativity <coughs> hypothesis. So I kind of do not believe you need a name for a thing in order to imagine it. So I, it might raise, so if we lived in a society like the one described in 1984, then I would say yes teaching children vocabulary or young people vocabulary that was obliterated from the language might speed things up. It would, of course, also mean that, you know, you don't teach for very much long afterwards. <laughs> but, uh, yes, I think, I think that, um, well, let me talk to you, those of you who are planning to become teachers, Please do not underestimate your role. What my answer to Yasemin was somewhat um, under, not, not um, emphasizing the role of a teacher as much as I think it should be emphasized. Uh, do provide role models to your students. Do not teach them to take um, lines of least resistance. Do not teach them to not question. Teach them to question. That's enough. If you teach them that it's all right to question, they'll do the rest.